You are listening to the Patriot Pastors Podcast, where we talk about today's issues from a pastor's perspective, as well as calling America back to the faith of our fathers. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. We ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Hello and welcome to the Patriot Pastor Podcast. I am your host today, Pastor Harold Smith. My co-host, Wade Lentz, has the day off. Actually, it's not a day off. I think he has a funeral to do, so it's it's contrary to what most of you believe. We do work longer than three hours a week. Occasionally, we have to do a funeral, and um, I know Brother Wade was uh, preparing for that last night and is doing that today, but we are blessed to have a special guest on the program today. We have Jonathan Murdoch here from Port Arthur, Texas. He was in the area, and if you're in Arkansas, that's in the area because, well, you know, most trees in Arkansas look like a cane pole. They don't fork much, so if you're around, we're probably kin or know somebody that is, but Jonathan is here doing a conference on missions in the Conway Perry Association, and uh, I got to meet him last night, and so... I just want to welcome him on the broadcast. He's going to talk about mission work that his church has been involved in in Mexico, Central South America. Hey, Jonathan, why don't you tell us where you pastor at? Thanks, Brother Harold. I really do appreciate having me on here today. Um, I pastor in the what we call the armpit of Texas down in in Port Arthur, Texas. Um, There is nothing there but refineries. And I remember when we first moved there, driving around trying to show my wife the beauty of Port Arthur. And somebody said, well, you got to go over the bridge. And when you it, literally, there's just like this, it's a massive bridge. You go over the bridge and all you see is refinery. And that's the scene. And it's like, that's where you're supposed to take and take a look at the, you know, what's going on. Uh, so I pastor in Port Arthur, Texas. Um, it, we, we are a bilingual church. It's a really strange situation, but population in Port Arthur, about 53% Hispanic. And so our church is about 50-50, Spanish-speaking and English-speaking. And, and so we do everything in two languages, one service. And, and so that's where I pastor. And um, I really appreciate you having me on here today, Carol. Well, I, I'm excited to have you on. And, you know, a lot of times um, we, when preachers get together, you know, we always tell war stories about old deacons that tried to sink the ship and then, it usually transitions at some point to missions, you know, who do you guys support? How do you do missions? You know, have you been on any mission trips? And so anytime we have a chance to bring on a missionary or someone that was, was once a missionary or heavily involved in missions. And so I know for a fact that you were a church planner in Mexico for about 10 years. Could you tell us how you ended up planning churches in Mexico and what that looked like? Yeah, so we went on a mission trip. I was serving a church in Salado, Texas, and we went on a mission trip uh, to Jalisco, Mexico. And I saw people in Mexico that had never heard the gospel before. And so the guy from our trip was kind of loosely uh, connected to the state convention in Texas, the Baptist State Convention in Texas. And, and so I was like, when we get back, I'm going to call the IMB and give them a piece of my mind. Why aren't there missionaries in Mexico? And he said, well, they don't want to go. I was like, what are you talking about? They want to go. They're waiting in line to go to India. And he goes, because it's Mexico, they don't want to go. And so I was like, that's wrong. I'm really going to call them and tell them what I think. And he said, why don't you go? And so a month later, I had given away all my things and I just moved to Mexico and didn't know Spanish. And I moved to the ghetto of Mexico City, um, 30 million people. And I'm there in Mexico City. And a month after being there, uh, I preached my first sermon in Spanish um, by, by the grace of God. Now, my Spanish wasn't very good or perfect, but I could communicate, no? And so that's, and, and eventually, we I had a very low view of the local church, and I meet a man named Brother, uh, Brother Randall Easter, and we become members of their church, and then I get in the grass for the local church, and we plant a church. So and, you went down there not sent by a church. Did you go sent by so, IMB or NAM? Or no, I, no, no, it was my dream. It was always my dream to be an IMB missionary. And then in working with some IMB things, I, I realized I don't want to do that. And so I just, I went sent from my church. They didn't really send me. I just told them I was going. And I didn't ask for any money. 
and I took the George Mueller approach and I just moved there. Um, it was really funny because at the onset of that, people started giving me all this money because I didn't ask for any money and people just started giving me all this money. I had enough money to live for two years without anybody giving me money. And so it really wasn't really the George Mueller approach because I had all this money in the bank. <laughs> I got robbed one day in, in, in the ghetto of Mexico. I got robbed by knife point and they stole my wallet. And so the church clerk sent the card and the pen number together in an envelope to me in Mexico. Somebody stole it out of the mail and stole all my money. Uh, and so the bank wouldn't give it back to me. And so then it was uh, really like, all right, we'll see if you're really going to take the Mueller approach. And the Lord provided and sustained me. But so I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily sent. I just went. And, and that was the problem that eventually led to us becoming members of Brother Randall's church. Right. And that's, that was at the time, probably first Baptist church of Briar, which is now by the word Baptist church. Is that correct? That's correct. And at the time there were about 30 people. Yeah. <laughs> and so we joined so this church. How did you church. meet, how did you meet Randall then? Was he doing missions in Mexico? So, I mean, how did so, that come about? So we got, uh, asked to do to preach this reformed pastors conference in Jalisco, Mexico, the same place that I had gone when the Lord called me in Mexico. And he went for the purpose of trying to find a Mexican pastor to get involved in missions. And he didn't find one, but he met me. And so I'm literally notes in the hand going to the pulpit. And, and Brother Randall says, Hey, who's your authority? But I'm going to preach. Like we just finished singing and this morning, everybody, all these guys are sitting there waiting for me to go preach. And he says, who's your authority? And I was like, Jesus Christ, what are you talking about? Obviously he's my authority. He goes, no, no, no. Who do you answer to in, in ministry? All these people are watching the conversation because they're waiting for me to go preach. And I'm like, who do you think you are asking me? Like, I'm going to preach. And, and I, I was like, I, I don't have anybody. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, I want to talk to you. And so I'm trying to preach. And, and, all, and, and this is in my mind, like, why did he ask me that? So I come down to the pulpit, and I'm like, well, what do you want to talk to me about? I was like, oh, no, i got to prepare this. You've got to give me a couple of days. So then he calls me in, into, into his, his dorm room there, and he's like, all right, I'm ready to talk to you. And I'm just like, who does this guy think he is, right? And he and first thing out of his mouth, I think you're prideful and arrogant and, and this. And I'm listening to him like, who? you don't even know me, right? And he was right. And, and he was like, and I think you're in dire need of someone to give you direction. And man, we just started talking and the Lord formed that relationship. And he's my best friend. And that was 15 years ago. And, and I learned the local church through by the word Baptist church. Mm -hmm. um, man, we, we ended up coming and we, pl we planted a church, but we ended up coming and staying at brother Randall's church for two months with different families so that we could meet the families in the church. And, and we still consider them our church, our home church, you know, to this day, I still consider brother Randall, my pastor, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a, everybody has a brother Randall story that knows him. <laughs> they do. That was mine. <laughs> uh, well, so you're in Mexico city. You, you say you ended up planning a church there. So how long were you there? Was it 10 years? Is that right? Almost I was there. Years. I was there ten years. We planted the church about seven. It's uh, about eight years. Um, so we were at the church for about eight years that we planted. So about two years after I've been there, we planted the church. Okay, and so then you moved back to the states, got out and of church planting. Trent, Trinity Baptist Church. It was actually kind of another church plant. Trinity Baptist Church was looking for a reformed bilingual pastor, and so there's a plethora of those everywhere. And so they kind of got stuck with me and we really came, when I came into there really treated that as a church plant. Um, it was very, very small and, um, and man, the Lord's really blessed us there. And, and the Lord, uh, is really doing a, It's marvelous. What, what's going on at our church right now. Amen. So now that you're back here in the States, you're, you're essentially doing the same type of work. You're working in a bilingual church. And, um, but you're still heavily involved in missions in, I think you told me, Me I'm not going to say it, Mexico, Ecuador, Honduras. Is that correct? Mexico, Salvador, and Honduras right now. Salvador. Well, um, 
That gives so, you my geography grades from high school. <laughs> so when, when, when we come back, the church, we're trying to figure out, like, because the church was spending all this money, like, they, they were paying $140 a month to some group messaging thing so that everybody could send each other a text. And I'm like, there's 15 of us, guys. I mean, you know, and so we're cutting all these things out of the, out of the budget. And we come to the state convention, you know, the cooperative program and this, right. and these Latin Americans are saying, what is the SBC? Like, we, what, what is that? And so I'm trying to explain the SBC and they're like, why are we sending them money? And so I said, look, I'll give a year and see if we can work with the SBC. At the end of that year, we made a decision. It's no benefit to us as a church. And so we left the SBC. And, but we are evangelical. And, you know, we're, we're definitely not, we do not want to be known as the Calvinists that don't do missions and evangelism. And so we're all about it. So we said, well, then where are we going to be involved? And so we looked at other organizations. And all of a sudden, through the providence of God, here we are with all these opportunities in South America. Um, but what did it was our, the men of our church one evening were sitting around trying to figure out what we were going to do. And we just asked the simple question, what can a church do in missions according to the word of God? What is our responsibility according to the word of God in missions? Because it doesn't matter the size of your church. It matters what we're called to do from the word of God. And we, we, we came to the conclusion. So another part of that is I never finished seminary. And I'm not anti-seminary 100%, but I think it's unnecessary. And I'll explain. So a lot of guys are probably going to hear that and be like, what do you mean it's unnecessary? Obviously, education is necessary. Yes. But I believe the local church is equipped to do that. And so many times... Uh, I'm talking to guys and they're like, yeah, but the seminary can do what the church can. And I'm like, wait a second. The New Testament tells me the church can. And, and, and so, so as we're dealing with that, we are sitting here and we're like, we believe biblical missions is to train pastors and plan to reform churches. And we believe that even though we're a small group of believers here at Trinity Baptist Church in Port Arthur, we can be involved actively in that. And so the Lord in his providence placed like these five guys at the, at the first from Latin America, from Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico. And, and so we just started talking to these guys, asking how we can help them, how we can serve them. And that led to a Zoom meeting. And so we started this Zoom call on Wednesdays and Brother Randall and I would take turns teaching it. And at first it was kind of like, we didn't really know what we were doing. Like, <laughs> and, and, and our side, when we get, I get done teaching and I'm thinking, man, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't going to go well. Like, like these poor guys. And we're like getting these messages back, man, brother, thank you so much. That's exactly what I've been looking for. And it kind of gave us some confidence and, and now that Zoom meeting is about 20 to 25 guys every week. And, nice. and it's, it's way more structured now. And, and so we're, we really believe that it's important to train pastors in soteriology, ecclesiology, and eschatology. And, and so we really focus on pastoral training in those areas. Um, and, and so... Uh, man, just like last the last three weeks, Tom Nettles has done it, and uh, for us teaching about distinctives of Baptist theology, and and some of these guys it was kind of over their head, but as we're on the side on the side working this out in messages and stuff, and they're like, you know, all of them now are like, man, it was so helpful, and and so that's what we're doing now. So so you're doing that weekly with these pastors over the internet, we, weekly over make- the you also make trips down there. I know because you and Alan and Randall and some other people just got back from a trip. Right. So we, um, we believe in two, two things. Once again, training pastors and planting and reforming churches. So we're pouring into these brothers, not just only on the zoom call, but I have about five to six conversations every week with one, with these guys just asking different counsel 
And and if I haven't talked to a guy in a couple of weeks, I want I want to personally talk how things going. And so we're we're kind of just uh, you know accountability there with some of them, and and so we do that. But we want their churches to grow, and we want them to flourish, and want them to grow in doctrine, and and so we want them to grow um, and as and, and reform as churches. And so we believe the way that we can do that is to do conferences there at where they are. So Mexico, this last trip was a very unique conference. It was the first time we were able to do this, but there was about six of those churches represented. And so about six of these churches come together to do one conference. And, and there was about 20 leaders and pastors from these churches that we were able to meet with during the day and, and, and give some pastoral care and training there. And, and so it was really our our mindset when we first started was if we could ever get all these people together and meet like that it would be beautiful and and so that's what we did and it was really really an incredible time there in 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 San Cristobal the ones who know Alan have kind of seen or heard his passion after that um because it really was just the beauty of the Lord to see them singing biblical songs and write songs and to see them taking care of the church, um, and it, it was really, really a, a good time. But we do the same thing in Honduras and Salvador. And so every year, we also have a brother in Pachote, Mexico. Um, uh, we call him the Mexican Spurgeon. He looks just like Spurgeon, and, and he, he, he kind of has some Spurgeon-esque to him, you know. But um, we do, we, so we went to Pachote this year as well um, and, and did the same thing. Um, and so it does two things. One, it works for the reformation of the church, you know, a uh, simple reformanda, always be reforming. And then number two, it gives people in our churches a way to be actively and personally involved with these church families and pastors. And, and so it gives them an opportunity to be a part of that as well. And, and it's been really, really good. And that's wonderful news. Um, so you guys clearly have been long-term plugged in, actively involved in missions in an area, and that's what you look for. So many times, you know, as a pastor, uh, I would get these emails, hey, I'm going to the Philippines, and you're talking to a kid right out of Bible college or seminary. He doesn't know anything about the Philippines. So I've always kind of shied away from just the, Hey, God's called me here. And I've tried to work with people that are already there have established because I mean, let's be honest as a pastor, we don't have unlimited funds. No, you know, I, get, I get an email from a missionary nearly two or three a week. And these are just blind calls or blind emails fishing for support, you know, and since you can't help everybody, I try to be deliberate and intentional about who I do help and who I recommend. And uh, a lot of times I can't recommend, I can't support a missionary because of limited church resources, but I can recommend missionaries. I can say, now nah, we don't support these guys, but it is a good work. They're doing a good thing. How could someone support the work that you and brother Randall and others are involved in since you, I mean, I don't know. Do you guys have like some kind of umbrella, um, uh, Right. Yes. Send that so, too, or does it just go to so a church? You tell us. We we have so two things. I'm going to answer it in two ways. Um, we start. We, we we've named what we're doing as Fellowship of International Reform Missions. We call it Firm. And and the reason that we did that is because one, American missions most of the time is we're doing this right. Let me show you how we're doing it. Well, one of the brothers from this group has been twice to preach at my church and has, done, has, has, has instructed and called my church to repentance. And, and he's a brother. And we walk hand in hand. I mean, like, um, he, when we plan the next year calendar, we will fly him here to the States and he'll be at the table with us telling us what we need to do because, because he... He's, I mean, he, he's a brother, Felipe and Tuxa. And, and so um, we, we've named this Fellowship of International Reform, Reform Missions. And we believe that it must be local church ran. 
And so we don't ever keep money in the bank. So we don't ever want to sit on money, right? So if somebody sent money to our church, um, we have a special account for that, but we're immediately going to say, how can we invest here? And we're going to do something with it. Um, and, and it's going to go directly to um, an aspect of ministry or one of these brothers. So one, one of the joys is that we've taken all of our missions money. Um, we have, and by the word has, and we give every month um, to these brothers uh, and not to all of them. So I said, that, you know, there's 20 something on the Zoom call, but the brothers that we think man, this guy's in fellowship with us or, or even, even, even there's a couple of guys that they're just not there yet, but then they're growing tremendously, but they're dirt poor and they just need help, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, so we, 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 we have a group in that group that we've determined that we're going to support every month financially. And, and so we do that. So we have a separate bank account, but we don't have any overhead. Right. So, so because it's local church oriented and if somebody gives money and we really don't know what to do with it, then we will call one of these brothers and say, Hey, Hey, give us the needs and then try to collect all those needs and say, okay, this is how we're going to distribute that. Right. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. So if somebody wanted to contribute or if they wanted to contribute, obviously they could send money to your church in Port Arthur, or they could send it to buy the word there in Azle, Texas, but how would they get in touch with you? If they just wanted to get more information than we're putting out on a podcast, sure. The they can way to contact you. Is it got an email or something? Yeah. They reach out yeah to my, e- my email address is, is really easy. Jonathan underscore Murdoch at yahoo.com. And, uh, man, just send me an email and, and, uh, you know, we'd love to, to talk, talk to people about it. And, and so it's beautiful what we're doing and we have a special connection. Um, and um, it, it's amazing what the Lord's doing, but I don't think it's only unique to us. You know, with all this stuff that's going on in the SBC and all this, I think more guys are going to start thinking about this. And so more than saying, hey, join what we're doing, which if you don't know how to do, you know, get involved, if you don't have any connections to get involved in something like this, man, I would love for you to get involved with us. You know what I mean? I would love for these brothers to be more blessed than, than they are. Um, but more than that is the concept of your local church needs to be training and, and, and sending out pastors and planting and reforming churches. Right. That, is the, that is the biblical model of missions. And so every church needs to be doing that. Um, and, and one thing that, we, that, that I think that I see for so long in the SBC it has been, I'm sorry, I'm picking on the SBC because I was SBC. And, and so one thing that was so ingrained in us is, can I share a story? Let me, let me share a story. No, so, no, you can't. I'm just so kidding. I'll be, I'll be quick. So I'm sitting in my office one day and this guy comes in from our state convention and he wants to come talk to me. He comes in and he's walking and he has a, a handwritten note in a book. And he, he heard we have a good pul- pulpit um and so he went he used kind of used that i wanted to come see your pulpit and so we walked to the sanctuary sees the pulpit and i I look at him i say look why are we here you know like let's get to the point and and he says well you guys haven't given money in five years to the sbc blah blah no we haven't what's your intentions and i was like he's like what's your intentions with the state convention and i said we don't have any and i was like we're done like for us we've made the decision we're done and he comes, I said, let's go to my office and talk. So I'm telling him why. And he gets really, really upset. And he was, he was kind of redheaded and bald. And so his head got really red and he was really upset. And he said, you need to stop worrying about all these issues and be involved in the Great Commission. He didn't have a clue what we were doing. Yeah. We're working with 20-something brothers in South America, planting, reforming churches, trying to figure out if it's right for us to ordain a pastor who's planting a church you know, this is what we're doing in missions, but he could not fathom missions in the Great Commission outside of the SBC. Yeah. And I think there's a lot, a lot of folks in that same mentality. And, and I think what it's done is it's limited our view of the local church. 
And it's made us think, I can't be involved in training pastors because if I want to train a pastor, I need to send him to seminary. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, you need to meet with him. So an- another, so I think that's done that. And then the number two, it's made it seem like we can't be involved in planting churches. Yes, we can. Um, there's a series of books that are very, very helpful um, in that. And it's Pastoral Theology by Albert Martin. And I read those this past year. And it's a three volume, $80. If, if you're a poor pastor, save your money, buy them. They'll be the best $80 you spent this year. And one thing that he does is he takes theology and the weighty theology that you learn at seminary and he makes it pastoral right and and he brings this aspect into pastoral care and as we're training these pastors brother randall and i've talked about that's what we want to do and and so basically we're taking these principles out of pastoral theology by albert martin and we're applying it um well, wouldn't you agree that Randall went to seminary long enough for every pastor himself? Exactly. I mean, so I he went like for 12 years or something. To he, he has enough degrees hanging on the wall. I can just borrow one of his, right? So, <laughs> so I, I mean, by osmosis, because he's my pastor, it just comes, right? And, <laughs> and so, um, but I like to say this. I, I don't think I'm this great theologian. I don't think that I'm the best in the world, but I'm a product of the local church. I went to seminary, but I didn't finish. Uh, I am who I am today because of the local church. Right. You know, Jesus Christ working through his church. And so I, I, I wholeheartedly believe in it. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I barely escaped high school. I think they just turned me loose because they didn't want to keep me there. Um, but th- that's okay. The Lord's worked with common men like fishermen. You know, it's not, it's not unbelievable that this has happened. Um. And, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I experienced the same thing in my own ministry. When I informed our local association, we wouldn't be supporting them anymore. I was told the same thing, you know, stop asking questions, quit questioning your, the leadership and get in line or you're never going to amount to anything. Mm-hmm. And, and I was told you're, you're never going to amount to anything if you do not support us. And, um, so, you know, I'll let the Lord be the, de- the decider of whether I ever amount to anything or not, but we've got to get away from this mindset. There's one way to train a pastor. There's one way to support missions. There's one way to plan a church. And I believe you have a biblical model for all of that, but for some person to say, we have the corner on truth, you know, everything goes through us. Uh, that is just, that's the height of Catholicism. That is a, 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 a a sin, a, a centristic way of everything comes to us and then goes out. It, it, the local church is those headquarters. I wholeheartedly applaud everything you've said uh, in that mindset, Jeff. So, so here's here's my. I think you you said it. Like, take all the money in the SBC and give it back to the local church. <laughs> let, let them do missions. Like, yeah. if we'll take these well, billions of dollars, you know. You couldn't do that without some training. You know, you have to learn these things. You guys didn't do it perfectly when you first started, but you've been no. doing it long enough. You've worked out a lot of those logistical and, and just practical things. And, and that's why I, I have no qualms with saying, you know, here's a mission organization that's been doing it long term, has good fruit, local church based uh, guys that you can call and talk to. You're not calling and talking to somebody's secretary, middleman, you know, it's just local church pastors doing mission work. And Amen. yeah, it, it's right. And it's been, it, it's been official and, and, you know, I mean, um, I, I think that, I, I think we're going to see this more and more and you and I agree on this. We're going to see this more and more and more b- because the, the tr- people are going to start asking the question, why do we need those? And, and I think it's right. I think it's right, brother. So. Yeah. Well, we're wrapping up. We're running out of time. Um, do you have any final words, anything you want to say in the next couple of minutes before we take off? Anything you so forgot I'll, to cover? I'll just re- reiterate something. Your church needs to be involved in training pastors and planning churches actively, not just sending a check. Like you are commanded by scripture to do that as a church. Amen. Amen. I agree with that hundred percent. Brother, appreciate it. Well, thanks for uh, coming on. Just hang around for a second. We'll talk soon as this is over. 
Thank you guys for tuning in today. There again, if you want to talk to Jonathan Murdoch about this, it is Jonathan underscore Murdoch at yahoo.com. Shoot him an email. Be glad to hear from you. Answer any questions, show you how you can get more involved other than just writing a check to somebody and mailing it in. So on behalf of Wade, I want to thank you all for listening to the Patriot Pastor podcast today and may the Lord richly bless you.